So this is what has been done, uh, and this is just to, to give you one of the examples. That, that there are basically hundreds, literally, of different experiments over the past 50 years on this. So, so this is just uh, one of the very earliest ones. Uh, basically, this shows, again, classical conditioning, similar to Pavlov's dogs, essentially pairing an electrical shock of the tail with a tactile condition stimulus of uh, the respiratory system here. Uh, so if you do that uh, and pair them uh, in, in such a way that you have the conditioning stimulus coming a little bit after the unconditioned stimulus, the tail shock, you will see that you get quite a profound change in uh, the activity of the reflex, as you can see here. Uh, training here is when you pair the two stimuli, the blue one, as you can see, uh, for several days afterwards, the response becomes much, much bigger uh, as compared to when you give the uh, unconditioned stimulus, the tail shock alone, or when you give the um, conditioned stimulus, the unpaired, uh, alone, as you can see down here. So essentially, if you pair them, you get a much, much larger response. The question then is, what is the background for this? What is the molecular mechanisms involved? And in order to understand this, uh, at least uh, one of the mechanisms involved is that uh, when you give this uh, unconditioned stimulus together with the conditioned stimulus, you have basically two different pathways which are being activated. So you have touching of the skin, you activate the sensory input to the motor neurons. If you give a stimulus to the electric, uh, to, to the tail, you activate also interneurons which uh, release serotonin and which have connections directly to the synapses of the sensory neurons. So that is what is shown up here. Now, if you do that uh, alone, if you just give the electrical stimulation, the unconditioned stimulus alone, or if you give the stimulus of the sensory neuron alone, uh, you will have either an EPSP evoked uh, because you have action potential coming down, calcium uh, flowing in, uh, and uh, release of uh, neurotransmitters which will uh, activate the motor neuron. The serotonin, uh, you have re release of serotonin here, 5-HT, binds to receptors which will lead to activation of uh, cyclic AMP as a secondary messenger. Now, what happens if you activate both of these together is that you have a situation where you have the sensory neuron being activated a little bit uh, after the unconditioned stimulus as shown before, which means that you actually have calcium uh, inside the motor neuron and that calcium can now bind to the uh, adenylyl cyclase and that leads to release of much more cyclic AMP. So the signaling becomes much more efficient if you uh, activate these two together. The question then is, what is cyclic AMP actually doing in this case? And if we just go back to what I had before here, uh, which is uh, the sensitization. So cyclic AMP actually turns out now to have very many mechanisms, but one of the initial ones was what is shown here. Basically, when you have an action potential which uh, is running down the axon to uh, the synapse. You have sodium flowing into the axon, you have potassium flowing out, and because of this depolarization that you have, because of the sodium inflow, you open uh, voltage-sensitive calcium channels, and it's the influx of calcium channels which causes the release of the neurotransmitters. Okay, so that's simple. So, then the next thing is we sensitize uh, the synapse. In other words, we activate serotonin interneurons coming from the tail shock. That serotonin increases cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP closes the potassium channels. This means that when you have sodium running in, you have a depolarization, but 
since the potassium channels are now closed, you have much less of a repolarization, which means that the action potential is now lasting longer. So if the action potential is lasting longer, you have a higher depolarization, or for a longer time at least, and therefore you have more calcium flowing into the cell and therefore you have higher transmitter release. So by changing the amount of cyclic AMP, you can regulate the amount of calcium and thereby the amount of transmitter being released from the synapse simply by changing how much the action potential actually depolarizes uh, the synapse. This turns out to be a common mechanism to regulate synaptic transmission in all kinds of animals, including us, and in all kinds of synapses. So whenever you sort of see serotonin, think cyclic AMP and probably regulation of potassium and eventually upregulation of transmitter release. An interesting thing then is that this works both at the short term because you have more cyclic AMP, but it also works on the long term. So the first thing here is that simply by getting more calcium into the synapse, you get more neurotransmitter release. But as you saw here, it lasts several days. So how can it last several days? The reason for that is that in addition to this immediate effect that you get more calcium into the cell. It turns out that there is also a cyclic AMP mediated uh, information going to the nucleus, which then causes long-term effects in terms of uh, new neurotransmitters being produced, new receptors, new release sites being produced uh, at the synapse, so that the synapse becomes more efficient also at the long term. Which means that at that point, you don't really need so much uh, more calcium as such because you already have more neurotransmitters available, you have more release sites. Uh, and therefore, by the same action potential, you now get much more uh, uh, release of uh, neurotransmitters. Um, that also means that uh, what you see at the long term uh, is that you get more synapses, so you have actual outgrowth of new connections, new synapses being made, and more of those synapses will have much more neurotransmitters available. So you have control situation, long-term sensitization with much more connections, and you have long-term habituation, uh, less synapses and synapses with less neurotransmitters inside of them. Uh, we know what the signaling is all about here. We have demonstrated that, uh, or Kandel has demonstrated that uh, part of the signaling is coming through uh, these uh, uh, signaling mechanisms uh, at the uh, uh, nuclear level, uh, s different uh, molecules which bind to uh, the um, promoter regions uh, of the gene uh, through phosphorylation of uh, some of these uh, mechanisms, uh, you see activation of the actual gene. Uh, so it's a relatively complex uh, uh, circuitry, but basically in, you could call the normal state without sensitization in this case, uh, there is one molecule, CREP2, which is binded to the promoter region. When you have activation of cyclic AMP and uh, signaling to uh, the nucleus, there is another molecule, uh, CREP1, which binds to the promoter region, whereas CREP2 is being removed, and through phosphorylation of this CREP1, you have activation of the gene, you have transcription of the gene, and therefore you can get uh, more synapses being made, you can get more neurotransmitter in the individual uh, synapses. Uh, I'm not going to go through.